uh, Alex has already pegged me as somebody who's going to talk about human rights. I'm actually <laughs> not going to do that, at least not as such. Um, I was going to start off by saying that we are at a critical juncture in Afghanistan, but it does seem like we're always at a critical <laughs> juncture in Afghanistan, and uh, as, at least as long as I've been working on it, which goes back further than I actually care to, to specify. <laughs> but um, the question I'd like to kind of probe here is, is that it was one Michael raises toward the end of his talk and also in the book, which is what, what is the broader strategy um, the broader reform strategy that any kind of recon successful reconciliation effort has to be a part of, um, and what role uh, or what what a part of that really will, will include accountability. What place does accountability have as part of that larger reform and reconciliation effort? Right now, we've got what um, five six weeks before the elections, an election that seems likely to um, return the Karzai administration to power and with his new alliances with a lot of the, the some of the people Minister Jalali mentioned as uh, having had um, a fairly dubious track records in the past, um, people who were co-opted or accommodated as part of the initial bond process, um, but without, I would say, without um, any kind of built-in uh, accountability as part of the terms of that bargain. And I don't know now, I guess the question is, how do we not only um, ensure that that is part of whatever terms we agree on for a reconciliation process, but in a sense, how do we retrofit that to whatever well, the process we have on the ground now in to, in to ensure we've got a, we're on track for state building and successful institutional reform um, in Afghanistan? We, uh, Michael, you mentioned that in the sense that everyone uh, that you've talked, there's a general agreement among the different sides of uh, look at the insurgents and the rest about wanting a just government, um, a st stability in Afghanistan, and justice. But if we go back to again the bond process, um, I'm not sure we would say that that really was something everybody was in agreement about. On one hand, yes, we all wanted stability, um, but what at what cost? At what cost, really? For what, what, did, what did stability really entail? Um, was it really the co-option that took place as part of the bond process, the accommodation of many of the former Mujahideen leaders, was to ensure that they were on board in, in bond, in agreement with the, 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 the general framework of the bond process, but there was very little required of them um, to that they had to, the very few constraints on behavior, very little required of them other than that agreement, and, and a, technically agreement to disarm, but even that was, ex, was very vague in the provisions of the bond document. Um, there was the, the, although the bond document does say, the bond accords do say that all, have, all weaponry, eventually they all should be part of a, um, I can't remember the exact wording now, but it was a... Self-defense. Yeah, that where they would be disarmed, essentially. Um, that wasn't the exact terminology. Disarmament became then a, a critical um, and a very complicated and a, a delayed part of the reform process immediately after Bonn. And Michael, you mentioned the, the confrontation between Minister of Finance Ashraf Ghani and uh, Defense Minister Fahim over funding for the Ministry of Defense and over pr pr uh, primarily over this continued funding of militias and the failure of the, to disarm very m many of the militia forces. And even after that, somewhat successful confrontation, which did finally pave the way for DDR to get underway, we still today have an enormous problem with um, illegal militias, and that many of them loyal to um, people who are still, manage, who still hold positions of power at various levels within the administration, within the parliament, or outside. And uh, that, per, that, that failure to find a way to ensure that these the, the accommodated leaders, those brought into the process at Bonn or that came on board at Bonn, followed through and were, were held to account to at least that part of the, the bargain, to disarm, um, undermine much of the other efforts at institution building in Afghanistan. Um, the Ministry of Interior still remains um, largely unreformed, huge problems with the, the police, in building a, uh, a competent uh, professional police force and the rest. We have 
enormous problems now throughout the, the administration with um, uh, allegations of corruption at all levels. I don't know, I guess the question to me is now how do we build in some kind of measure that those being brought in or given a place at the table or given a, a piece of the, the, the political uh, pie, as it were, are held to account in, in this way, that they are held to some kind of uh, terms of how, of, so they don't end up then undermining what we're trying to achieve in terms of state building in Afghanistan. Stability of, to say, laying down arms and agreeing not to continue fighting either the government or international forces is one thing, but stability in the broader sense of, of uh, not undermining the, the institutions of the government is a larger part of the, the overall the end result that we want to achieve. Um, let me see. And I, I guess I would see that one, one of the questions, I guess, then if we, if we pursue that, I think I would agree when, when, when Alex mentioned the kind of three choices before us, and there are more than that, but I think many of us would agree that we're going to have to come to some kind of negotiated settlement for a, a, if we're ever going to achieve an end to the conflict in Afghanistan. But if reconciliation would eventually would, would mean only accommodating another set of militia commanders without a, some kind of agreed upon set of rules on, and, or their agreement to the kind of rules of the game, the rule of law, then it would not then, I think, contribute overall to stability in Afghanistan. But this would apply not only to these commanders being brought in, but obviously, like I said, back to the initial, initial group of commanders who were part of the post-2001 settlement. Um, and if we don't have at this point a state that is functioning very well to, to, to ensure that there are some kind of um, and constraints and checks on behavior, who is going to enforce this kind of, uh, th these rules of the game? Who's going to ensure that those new, those brought into the process will abide, not only swear allegiance to the government and agree to lay down their arms, but disband, disarm, militia commanders and essentially cooperate with the, the institutional reform that's underway. And I'll leave it.